Once again, thank you to M&T for the sponsorship. It really says a lot about their feelings about the university to want to sponsor a program like this. And as Marilyn said, the uh, acronym TEARS for Talks that Inspire, Educate, and Resonate. And I have very little doubt that tonight's program will do all three of those things. So just a little bit about the format for tonight. It's going to be sort of organic, sort of fluid. So instead of each presenter having about, say, 15 to 20 minutes to give basically a self-contained presentation, uh, this is going to be talk show style Q&A. And instead of programs that typically will ask you to hold questions to the end and then by then you forget your question, if you have a question during the program, feel free to approach one of the microphones that we have in the aisles and as uh, soon as reasonably possible, we'll get you in with your question and uh, we'll make it uh, nice and dynamic and organic that way. So enough of me, I'll introduce the speakers for tonight and then turn it over to them. So sitting just to my right is Dan Kosick, a two-time graduate of Binghamton University, bachelor's degree in 2000, master's in social work in 2006, lives in the area, middle school social worker and sports coach, and he's going to share uh, what's an amazing journey from uh, being a cancer survivor to an elite level athlete. And sitting further to the right, George Catalano, who's had an amazing and storied career here at Binghamton University as a professor of biomedical engineering at the Watson School, and he is a SUNY Distinguished Service Professor here at Binghamton. And each one of you will be, now it's time for you to give a brief introduction, so we'll start with you, Dan. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dan. I am, is it all right if I stand? Yeah. Like when I talk? I feel like, I feel like I'm contained. <laughs> um, I'm a townie. I grew up across the river in Johnson City. Uh, I had a pretty average childhood growing up, and then when I hit my teen years, uh, things started to change. I had some uncomfortable discomfort in my right leg, and good parents did what they should do, and they brought me to the doctors, and after some tests and a biopsy, it was discovered that I had a benign tumor growing in my nerve, or in my nerve, yeah, in my right leg, and as a result, uh, they said I could have it removed and get rid of that pain and discomfort or potentially have nerve damage for the rest of my life, so I left it in for about a year and did what I wanted to do and play sports, but the pain intensified, and it was probably around 14, 15 years old, I decided to have that tumor removed. And when they went in to remove that tumor, they, dis or they discovered that that tumor went from benign to malignancy, and it was a pretty easy decision at that point. I was gonna have my right leg amputated above the knee and go through six months of precautionary chemotherapy. And I was a teen, and at that time in my life, it was just about, you know, how am I gonna get through this so I can get back to being a normal teen and playing sports again? So after I finished my chemo, I uh, got back into sports. I eventually rejoined my high school swim team. I started playing lacrosse again for, my, for Johnson City as a goalie. I found a new passion in alpine ski racing and dedicated my life to that for a period of time and started my family and eventually fell in love with something called obstacle course racing and climbing and hiking, and that sort of brings me to who I am today and why I'm here. Well, I won't stand. Um, <laughs> hi, my name's George Catalano, and I'm delighted to be here. It was really neat to meet Dan and, and to work with Steve. Um, I guess um, it all started for me back in high school in, in a certain kind of way. I went to high school not too far from here up in Syracuse, Christian Brothers Academy. And their whole mantra there was, life is about service. And I took that to heart. I, I really do think that that's true. And so these opportunities to work on some of the projects that we're going to talk about um, and show you, share with you tonight really are all, all about service. They're all about giving back to the community. It's all about um, maybe listening to the voices that not too often are heard. Um, and so it's, it's a great opportunity for me to share that with you. I've had the, opp the great ch opportunity actually to work with some wonderful students and many of them, as sweet as they are and as busy as they are, they came here tonight to, to maybe share some of their thoughts about these projects as well. So um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So George, we'll start with you and the students that you're working with are doing some amazing things through their, uh, their capstone projects. <laughs> Tell us about that uh, and their engagements within this community. Sure. Um, in engineering, um, I think in all departments now, they have to do a capstone design project. And I've headed up the biomedical engineering capstone design course for, gosh, 10 or so years now. And um, what it's all about is actually meant to be a bridge from being a student to being a professional in the real world. 
And that sounds easy, at least to me, but from their perspective, it's very challenging. But they, they really um, welcome the chance to do projects for real clients, to meet real needs, and to, to, to feel that they've really made a difference in the world. And I see a whole row of them here tonight, so should we ask them to come? Absolutely. Nikki, do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Nikki. Um, I'm a graduate student in the Biomedical Engineering Department. I've had um, the pleasure to learn from Dr. Catalano for the past three years, as well as work with my client for the past two. And so my client was Linda Fargnoli, and she is the founder of Fargnoli Farms. Um, and she offers uh, a stress management um, program uh, for high-risk teens and special needs individuals um, by using equine therapy. So during my senior year, my um, team and I, uh, one of which is right here, Jacqueline, um, developed a device that utilized pulse oximetry to obtain a, a biosignal known as PPG. Um, and this signal uh, was further analyzed by a program um, that could output numerical data that correlated with stress changes. So the ability uh, for Linda to use this empirical data in her grants uh, made for a more formidable application, uh, which means that she can continue to fund this program and most importantly, uh, continue to help others. So for my master's project, I decided to continue this work um, and add a few more components to the device, one of which measures skin conductance, uh, so we could look at the intensity of the emotions of um, Linda's patients during stress therapy. So these, product, or these projects not only provided me with the chance to sharpen my technical skills, uh, like circuitry wiring, um, coding, and design work, uh, but also hone in my soft skills like communication, leadership, and teamwork. So my time with Dr. Catalano and Linda has shown me how important it is uh, to listen to your clients' needs, follow through with the promises that you make, um, and to always remain involved in your community. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, for my project, I was uh, working with Dr. Teresa Schrader in the Southern Tier Special Needs Resource Center in Johnson City. And it was essentially a project where we were making a switch-activated ramp, a wheelchair ramp for the center where they had a uh, dance floor, and some of the children couldn't access it. So it was interesting coming from sort of a background where my expertise was in, was in biomedical engineering and doing a project that was mostly circuitry and mechanical engineering based, but just being able to make a tangible and direct impact to the local community was something that I drew a lot of meaning from, and it really just made all the effort worthwhile, especially seeing how happy the client was and how happy everyone at the center was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Miranda, and I graduated my um, bachelor, bachelor's in biomedical engineering last year, and I had such a great experience, I decided to save for uh, the master's four plus one program. My senior design project worked with a 20-ish year old woman with ALS, and she was an artist until she lost the ability to move her arms, and she used to be able to dance and do acting, and this really took a toll on her life. So we created a device that held her up, so she still had some mobility in her legs. She was able to dance and paint with her feet, and this device helped her be able to do those things, and it was extremely rewarding. Like Once we were able to put her in this device, she just had a huge smile on her face, and it just made us so proud all those countless hours working in the lab on using CAD and it just made it worth it and that, that's one of the main reasons I decided to become a biomedical engineer to to see the difference in people's lives and um, Dr. Catalano had a huge part of it we would have been able to do it without him so thank him for giving us this opportunity thank you So shy, Caitlin is going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Caitlin, and I'm also a master's student here in biomedical engineering. So when 
Dr. Catalano had, uh, was presenting our projects. He had people from the community come in and present what their needs were for all different aspects of their life, be it uh, the equestrian therapy or um, uh, technical objects that needed to be implemented in certain um, aspects. I'm forgetting what I was going to say. <laughs> anyway, uh, for my project, he, uh, Suzanne Gihorgian was, uh, came into our class and presented to us a village in El Salvador uh, called El Charcon that was having major problems with their um, trash accumulation. And because the village was right before the river, um, the residents of the village were seeing all the trash being washed downstream into the ocean and affecting the wildlife there. And they wanted to do something about it. So El Charcon happens to be Binghamton's sister city in El Salvador. So she came to us and asked if anyone had any ideas on how that we could help this village uh, deal with the trash problem. So my team, along with Ben over here, uh, decided that we wanted to take this project on because we wanted to help the community. And we built a heated press recycling system that could um, repurpose their used plastic bags and light trash into things such as clipboards and notebook covers for the community. And honestly, working with El, uh, Suzanne and uh, the village of El Charcon corresponding back and forth has been such an eye-opening experience on the good that engineering can do. It's not all just make money and get a job. It can really make a difference in people's lives. So I really thank you for the opportunity and bringing in all the wonderful individuals from this community. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming and sharing these stories with us. And a couple of threads really come out in common, one of them being meaningful service, and the other being turning obstacles into opportunities, which, Dan, is something I know that you, you talk about a lot. So how was it that you came to view obstacles and opportunities, and what was that journey like uh, with the first prosthetic leg that you had? Um, I'll stay seated. Well, uh, <laughs> so at 15, I, my first prosthetic leg seemed like this cool piece of equipment. And I realized that if I could figure out how to master this piece of equipment, I could probably do what I wanted to do, and like play sports. So uh, that's where my focus was, and that was my mentality. And, and as a kid, that's sort of how you think, is day to day. I've been working with kids for probably 18 years now, and I know it's really, you know, most of us feel sorry for kids when they go through difficult situations, um, because we just never want to see a kid suffer. But uh, because the way kids think and, and their resiliency, they tend to get through these things sometimes better than us than we do as adults. Um, so I'm actually really grateful and that everything happened to me the way it did and when it did. Um, and that sense of gratitude really didn't come to me until I was probably more of an adult, um, if you'd call me that now. Um, and when I got that sense of gratitude, I really started to believe that there was, I stopped labeling the, the moments in my life as good and bad and started seeing all moments as like new beginnings, new adventures, meeting new people. Uh, and so when that all happened, um, my perspective on everything changed. And I now saw all of the challenges and obstacles possibly in my life as really an opportunity for growth and gratitude. And when I think you find gratitude, I think you will always have enough, if not more, than what you need. So how did it feel to reach the, the top of your sport, having gone to the Paralympics competing on the Alpine ski team and, and reaching a level that many of us could only dream of reaching? Um, well, okay. Well, I'm uh, a goal-driven individual. And I feel like the successes in life that you appreciate the most and you feel most rewarded from uh, come from working hard and, and putting some time and dedication into it. And so uh, growing up as a person who's, I don't know where it came from, but uh, just setting these goals and then setting short-term goals to develop my plan on how I would get there, um, I, it makes life pretty easy because on my minute-by-minute -minute decisions, I can ask myself, am I doing things that make you know, myself getting closer to my goals or farther away from my goals? And so in 1995, I attended a ski racing camp, and I came home from this camp, and I basically had the goal that I wanted to make the United States adaptive alpine ski team and hopefully make it in time to qualify for the 2002 Salt Lake City Utah Paralympics. Uh, so this became my focus, and I developed my short-term plan and my short-term goals to get there and gave it all I had. I uh, went to school in the spring, or I'm sorry, in the fall semester, and then the day the semester ended, I packed up my car and I drove out west and I lived full-time in Colorado, training full-time, 
And then I came home and I cross-trained as much as I could here at home and made up my schooling in the summer months. And my dedication paid off. In 1997, I was uh, invited to be a member of the United States Adaptive Ski Team, which was much sooner than I expected. So I was able to compete in the 1998 Nagano Japan Paralympics, along with competing in the Salt Lake City Games, which was four years later. Um, being a member of the U.S. Disabled Ski Team was like one of the best experiences of my life. Uh, one, because of the reward of how much I put into it and how it paid off. But also, it was just this huge opportunity of growth because I'm a teenager coming from Johnson City and I now was able to travel the world. I traveled throughout the United States and Canada and Europe, New Zealand, Japan, um, meeting so many interesting people, visiting so many epic locations, learning about new cultures. I think up until that point, my most diverse experience was maybe Epcot and Disney World. Um, and so it was just an awesome opportunity for a teenager coming from Johnson City. And, and I, I don't think there's many experiences in life that could match what I got from the ski team. Great. Well, George, you've had a great show of support by the students coming out to, <laughs> <laughs> to talk about their project and to be here for you. Tell us about some of the other uh, service projects and engagements that uh, have been part of uh, your work over the last couple of years. What's interesting is I don't have any power over them anymore. I can't control their grades. The grades are turned in and they're still doing it. So I appreciate, as I've always appreciated all of them so very much. Um, the projects have been uh, really all over, all over the board. Um, we actually have a couple videos to show um, the uh, Miranda's project that dealt with uh, the, the young woman who is the artist. And I think, I think that will be it's a good time to show that. It's actually the students brought the project to me. I didn't come up with this project. They said, we have a neighbor who would would really like to be able to continue painting, maybe dance, and so they they um, designed this. And her paintings are really quite beautiful. So it's not, it's not um, just con confined to one species. We have projects that, um, that work with uh, um, individuals in the community that have animal rescue societies. Um, they have um, the horse farm. Linda Farnelli's horse farm is not only um, for autistic children and disabled children, but it also is a place where horses go. Uh, rather than to be slaughtered, they go there and they live out their lives ha having a wonderful life. Um, the other person that I work with is Willow, a Willow Sullivan. She has Willow's Wings, and that's an animal sanctuary. And her thing is that no matter how sick or how old the animal is, if that animal deserves a life, that animal deserves love, just like I think we all aspire to have. So we have a couple videos now, one for, excuse me, Willow, one for Linda. Willow's Wings Animal Sanctuary is a home environment for sick, old, and disabled animals that basically have no options left in their life. We're not a, we're not a facility where animals are kept in cages or pens. We are a home-like environment. We try to give them the quality of life that they would have if they were an individual animal placed in a single-family home. Willow's Wings Animal Sanctuary is the home to very, very many animals of different kinds, and myself. I refer to myself as their caretaker, housekeeper, feeder, maid, and mom. 
with each animal that comes into Willow's Wings, part of part of the protocol, at least in my mind, is if I'm going to take an animal in, then I need to be able to provide the animal with the best medical care. It doesn't do the animal any good for me to take it in and let it be sick and not cared for. The sanctuary is home to um, both domestic small and large animals, which are dogs and cats and exotics, which are birds and tortoises. Um, as long as, as well as farm animals, horses, goats, pigs, alpacas, chickens, ducks, and geese. Uh, at this point right now on the sanctuary, we have over 100 animals here. Most of them are senior, uh, many of them are disabled. Willow's Wings Animal Sanctuary is a home environment for our sick, old, and disabled animals. Uh, many people feel that disabled animals are a waste of money. The animals are, are happy, they're happy to be alive, they're happy to have someone love them, and along with that comes the support from the community and the population and not the stigma that comes with just because it's sick, old, and disabled, it should be euthanized. It should be supported, it should be cared for, it should be loved. And we look to the humans in this world to help us give that back to the animals that are at the sanctuary here. Dealing with helping Willow's about 80 pounds when she's really wet. She's a very small person, so she has to lift these heavy animals into a car to take them to the vet, and she does that all the time. Um, she's, she's truly a remarkable person. So one of the projects deals with um, that transport issue. We've had others deal with some of the wheelchair issues. And um, it's just been an honor, as it is an honor to work with these students. It's been an honor to work with Willow. And this next one is from Linda Farnoli Farms. Um, she does a lot of work um, with uh, special needs children. And she focuses on autistic children. Aut highly, um, sometimes highly functioning, sometimes not so highly functioning children. And she has these old horses and old horses and uh, needy children, they make a great combination. This is Callie and she would like to welcome you to Callie's Clubhouse. Farms has been serving our community with equine assisted services since 2009. Recently we came up with more programming ideas and wanted to be able to offer them to our community. My name is Dale Corbin and this is Ron Whelan, my husband, and we are the co-founders of Kelly's Clubhouse. We developed this nonprofit so that we could offer the majority of our services at no cost. We serve children with challenges, emotional, physical, children with autism, youth at risk, veterans, and we also have a senior connection where we go into nursing homes with our miniature horses and visit the elderly in our communities. There's a lot of uh, organizations out there that say they're for special needs kids, but they're really for the highest functioning level of special needs children. And you soon find out that your child with special needs isn't welcome there. <laughs> what? That's right. That's true, though. But the, here, one of our writers, who's a regular writer still today, when he first came, my understanding is he came nonverbal and he spoke that day in regards to riding horses. I had a rider several years ago who has kind of outgrown the program. He had a high functioning form of autism. He was verbal, but he was where you couldn't touch him. He was afraid of bugs. I was walking around the arena with him and he reached over and took my hand and I can remember Miss Linda going, that's a big deal to me. And that, that's why we're here. We've had children come that are classified nonverbal who leave our programming or continue in our programming speaking full sentences and 
communicating amazing stories and thoughts, telling about their day at school, um, asking if they can take things back from the farm to, to talk to their friends about in school, going home and telling their parents at the dinner table that they made new friends and saying their names. It's a place that motivates speech. Horses are hypervigilant. As prey animals, they are constantly scanning for danger. People with emotional and physical trauma can relate to that. Horses can also hear the human heartbeat from four feet away. Studies show us that they can regulate their heartbeats to match the human heartbeat. It's wonderful to be on the back of a horse, but it is magical to walk next to a horse and be accepted, to know that they have chosen to be with you. So as it is an honor to work with uh, Willow, it's an honor to work with uh, Linda. Um, they've dedicated their lives to try to make a difference in the community. Um, they have these special, unique skills and they, they give them freely to all that need them. Great. So we're about halfway through the program. I thought I'd offer it up if anyone, does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Either come to the mic or just shout it from where you are. We'll move on to the next thing, and then certainly, as I said before, if you have a question, come up at any time that you would like. So, Dan, you talked about some of your uh, earlier competitions in skiing, and your days of competing are still going on. So, tell us uh, what you're up to and, and, and how you got into uh, obstacle course racing. Okay, so um, I retired from the ski team in 2002. <laughs> And uh, like I mentioned, I'm a, a goal-driven person, and I had the goal that eventually I would hopefully marry my high school sweetheart, and luckily she said yes, and uh, she's here tonight. Um, so we settled down in 2002. We finished up our education. We created our home. We started our family, um, and things were going well. I was staying uh, very connected to athletics, though. I was living a healthy and active lifestyle coaching uh, able-bodied ski racers, I call them ten-toed freaks, up at Greek Peak. And I was uh, coaching boys lacrosse. And uh, like I said, just living the, the grown-up life. And then in 2012, I had a friend come up to me and ask me if I wanted to do an event called Tough Mudder. And, and I had no idea what this was, so I did a Google search on it and come to find out Tough Mudder is a 10-mile obstacle course race through intense mud, over, through, under obstacles. Um, some of the obstacles require you to jump off 30-foot platforms into muddy pools of water, uh, monkey bars on steroids, jumping over fire pits. Uh, most interestingly, you get electrocuted uh, and sometimes on uh, some of these obstacles. And I thought this was really crazy, but um, he planted a seed. And I went back and I had a conversation with my prosthetist, the, the man who makes my legs. Um, our healthcare system is broken, but um, no matter how good our healthcare system is, I don't, or healthcare that you may have, I doubt there's an insurance company that would cover a prosthetic leg for you to go out and completely destroy it in an obstacle course race. So, with the support of my prosthetist, he created this leg for me that he thought would be durable enough for me to go this 10 miles through this mud and everything. And it was really up to me if I was going to get fit enough to do it. So I got this leg, and I think the first night I got it, I went to the high school's track, and I could barely run one loop around the track. And I just stuck with it, developing my plan and how I was going to get better and faster and stronger. And eventually I got three to five miles of hilly roads, and I figured, you know what, I'm going to sign up for this event, and I'll figure out how to do the other five miles in the mud when I get there. So I, in 2013, uh, just, out of Saint, just outside of St. Louis, I did my first Tough Mudder event. Um, it wasn't pretty. It was uh, pretty brutal. I struggled for the last few miles with some significant prosthetic issues. I was beat up. I was sore. Uh, not to mention, I really couldn't see for about two days after the event because I had so much mud in my eyes that my corneas got scratched. Uh, but one thing was for certain, I wanted to do another one. I wanted to um, grow on this opportunity that I had found. And so I signed up for another one in 2014, and then another one in 2015. And uh, I just couldn't get enough of it. And I started to adapt to what obstacle course racing was, um, making changes to my prosthetic leg, um, specializing my training more here at home. 
And eventually Tough Mudder recognized my interest in 2015 with the events that I was doing and they actually created a video on me and it sort of went viral and if you don't mind I would like to show that video now. Tough Mudder is just one of those things that it's hard not to fall in love with. Every time I succeed at something like that, I, I feel like I develop more confidence and more strength to be able to handle whatever comes at me in life. My name's Dan Kosick, I'm 37 years old. Uh, I lost my leg at the age of 15 due to cancer. At 15, the biggest struggle that came to me was this extra self-conscious feeling. I remember many times slipping and falling or tripping and it's like, oh my God, all these eyes around me. I struggled with friends. I struggled, you know, with bullying. And when I would go out in public, I would put my leg against the wall so that it was more hidden. At the time, the best they had was basically trying to find women's nylons that would match my skin color. I would sit there for, it felt like for eternity, trying to find the exact match. Eventually I was like, wait, you know, what am I hiding here? I'm gonna be walking this way for the rest of my life. I just don't wear the cover anymore. You know, like I'm wearing a Mercedes Benz on my leg. I might as well just show it off because that's what it costs. How's PE? Good. Good. Today I had another substitute. You did? I work with kids that are facing obstacles or needs. When I can share this, you know, story with kids about my own life, they know that I've had my own struggles. These poster boards are going to be your name boards. What you're going to do is make a personal poster board of yourself and say, this is my name. These are things that are important to me. Don't be afraid to put stuff down that might talk about how things have not been so easy in your life. Everybody's situation is different, and I just want them to know that I'm here to help them through whatever struggles that they may have. I want to know what makes you unique as a person and as an individual and separate you from everybody else. It didn't you know, happen overnight where all of a sudden I could run a Tough Mudder. Every little success I had, starting off with just learning how to walk, really developed my confidence. If I can go, you know, this far, you know, let me just go one more step farther. As soon as I did my first Tough Mudder, I fell in love instantly. I do as many as I possibly can and hope to do many more. I am Dan Kosick, and I am a Tough Mudder. I uh, shaved my head actually for St. Baldrick's Day here on campus two years ago, but I never told my family I wasn't going to grow it back. Um, I wanted it to be my choice, not that uh, I should have done it years ago. So anyways, uh, this was 2015, and that year, uh, I don't know if you want to call it like a midlife crisis or what at 37, but um, my motivation and my desire to do more, just I couldn't you know, get enough. So in 2016, I ended up signing up for multiple events and just doing as much as I possibly could. And Tough Mudder invited me to do some obstacle course testing, and uh, it was like the best day of my life. Like I got, I got to go play on this adult playground all day. I mean, my calluses were falling off. I mean, it was painful, but it was so much fun. So I was at this event, and this guy comes up to me, and he says, uh, "We're going to see you at Worlds." And I said, "Well, what's Worlds?" And he and he explains that Worlds Toughest Mudder is a 24-hour obstacle course race in the middle of an extreme environment. And I was like, whoa, I've never heard of that. Um, so I had about a two and a half hour drive home to figure out how I was going to tell my wife I wanted to do World's Toughest Mudder. Um, so she, he planted this seed, and I came up with a plan. Um, I, was, I was really nervous because going from 10 miles to trying to figure out how I was going to run as far as I could um, through some extreme environments for 24 hours straight was something I was not prepared for. And this was September, and World's was in November. So I figured the safe thing to do was I joined a relay team. Uh, there was eight of us on the team. I was the only adaptive athlete. The majority of the team were veterans. Uh, we all represented an organization called Team Rubicon, which provides uh, natural disaster relief around the world. And the whole plan at Worlds, which is World's Toughest Mudder, is a five-mile loop with 20-plus obstacles per loop. And you run as many loops as you possibly can in that 24-hour period. So our eight-person team was, the goal was four people was going to be on the course at all times, and we were going to rotate four on, four off, four on, four off. Um, halfway through the event, several of our teammates started to fall out due to fatigue and injury. I was feeling good, so I um, was able to do a little bit more than some of the other teammates on, on, in the group. Uh, our team completed 55 miles total. 
I did 35 of the 55 miles, and on my plane ride home from Las Vegas, because it was in the desert, um, I was thinking on how I was going to tell my wife that I wanted to do World's Toughest Mudder in 2017, but as an individual, and see what I could do. So um, at the age of 40, I decided that I was going to do World's Toughest Mudder and set the goal to do 50 miles by myself in 2017. And in 2017, I ramped up my training more and got focused and became a Tough Mudder ambassador, which basically just a, a free spokesperson for them, I guess. And went on and proud to say I set a world record and was the first above knee amputee to ever complete 50 miles at World's Toughest Mudder. Uh, right after the event, I got an awesome invite to be a part of an organization called ROMP, which stands for Range of Motion Project. And ROMP is about bringing awareness and funds to the 80% of amputees in the world that do not access or cannot access uh, appropriate prosthetic care. Um, and once you step out of the United States, it's, it jumps up to like 90% of the world's population of amputees that cannot access, access um, appropriate prosthetics. So what I was invited to do was I was a group of amputee and non-amputee or, or athletes to climb a 19,347 foot active volcano in Ecuador. And the goal was to show the world that you're not disabled by an amputation, but by the lack of a prosthetic device. So in 2018, my focus became more climbing and hiking and still doing obstacle course racing in between. Um, I basically Google searched what are the toughest hikes I can do in the Northeast to, for training. So, you know, one weekend I went out and did Devil's Path, which took me 18 hours. And then the next weekend I did, or next month I did uh, Presidential Traverse, which took me like 16 hours. And then the Great Range. Um, these were all my training activities prior to going to Ecuador. Uh, we headed to Ecuador uh, with the attempt to summit Cotopaxi uh, at 19,347 feet in September. Uh, which was a great success. We have a video of that. I well, believe, yes. yeah, I would like to bring it in a little bit later. Okay, okay. Yeah, so no. we'll come to that in a little bit. Do you bit. want me to share the Cotopaxi stuff now? No, I can, oh. uh, I can mix in the question first and we can come to it. Okay. So I'm curious, uh, on a typical week, what is your training like? If there is a such thing as a typical week, what do you do? Um, well, I, I have two very active young daughters in middle school, so uh, after work, it usually revolves around their activities um, and my wife is a second grade teacher and you know and she likes to do her things too so I try to get the majority of my workouts in prior to work so I, I swim three days a week before work I try to do my strength training uh, one or two days a week um, maybe before work or one day after work I go for longer runs on the weekend and then my wife and I have our time doing a workout together on Sundays um, so that's our alone time sometimes is going to the gym together I don't know if that's what she thinks good alone time is. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, I get in when I can. Um, when I was training for Worlds, it was obviously a little bit different focus on getting the miles on my feet. But that beats up my back with my prosthetic leg. So now that I'm not trying to do anything like 50 miles and more just in the 10 to 20 mile range, I try to you know, limit my running to like twice a week now. George, uh, when we began the program, you started talking about service and how the roots of that were planted early on. And now at this stage of your career and, and uh, going to be retiring in the near future, how do you feel about service just as you reflect on the, uh, what you and the students have been able to accomplish? And we've seen so many of these different community engagements and so many people being helped along the way. Um, it's a great question. I think it's the most uh, rewarding thing that I've done as a professor. Uh, this will be... I'm finishing up my 42nd year as a professor, so I guess I've either worn, out, worn all my students out or I've worn myself out, but it's been, it's been the greatest uh, thrill of all uh, to be able to, to work with students, to work with community um, organizations. Um, the quality of the individuals, the quality of the students, the quality of the community partners has just made it all very worthwhile, and it's gone by really fast. Um, I look forward to, um, even though I am planning to retire, to continue to work. Even if I just go out and walk horses and dogs, I think that'll, that'll be a, something that I look forward to doing even more. Great. 
So are we ready to show the video, or do you have another story you'd like to share before we do yeah, that? Yeah. Um, well, I just would like to introduce sort of, I mean, there's not really much to the video with the summit, but um, going to Cotopaxi, or going to Ecuador, I should say, um, there was a total of 24 of us. Uh, some were professional guides. Uh, 19 were, no, I'm sorry, 11 were amputees, and 19 were able-bodied athletes that came from the States, or, or came over. Um, wait, that didn't make sense. There was uh, 19 total of us, 11 of us were amputees, and then there was a, a handful of professional guides. And what happened is we got over there, and it, it's one thing you just can't like, get off the plane and go try to hike 20,000 feet. So you have to acclimate. So we did two training hikes prior to our climb on Cotopaxi, which both uh, hikes brought us up to 16,500 feet. If you're familiar with mountains, there's uh, the highest mountain in our continental US is in California at 14,500 feet roughly. Um, so you really can't get that kind of height in our own country. Um, but down there, it's all over, it's awesome. The, the Andes provide great, beautiful terrain to go have fun on. And so after we completed those acclimation hikes, uh, it was now time to hike to the mountain refuge, which was at roughly 17,000 feet on Cotopaxi. We spent about 24 hours at, at this mountain refuge doing some glacier training because they were all snow-capped uh, mountains. And that's where we learned that our group of 24 would be broken up into groups of three. We'd be tethered together for safety purposes. And the guide who had been following us throughout the eight to nine days that we were there um, strategically planned on when these groups of three were going to be leaving the mountain refuge. Uh, he wanted us all to summit Cotopaxi at roughly sunrise. So the first groups uh, were sent out roughly at 8 p.m. at night, and I was the second to last group to leave at 11.30 p.m. We hiked through a beautiful starry night um, up the glacier um, until I realized on the way down how intense and awesome which we walked over, um, which was crazy to see the crevasses when we walked back down. But um, I was the second group to reach, or as part of the second group, to reach the summit at roughly 6.10 a.m., uh, 10 minutes prior to sunrise. I was able to spend about 45 minutes at the summit, and words really cannot describe what you feel when you step foot on top of a mountain that's 20,000 feet. Uh, I took in the views the best I could. I want to say the experience was like literally burned into me because no one gave me the information that the sulfuric gas that comes out of an active volcano burns your eyes and lungs greatly. So 45 minutes of crying because you're like, this is awesome, but also crying because your eyes are burning um, will never leave me. Um, and it was just an amazing experience. And, and because I took on this new adventure and got into hiking and the things that I was doing, um, I was also fortunate enough to become a Merrill brand ambassador uh, in 2018. And, you know, I think an every athlete grows up wanting to be sponsored by a shoe company. And here I was at 41 getting a shoe sponsor, which was pretty cool. And their support and sponsorship of me throughout this adventure and adventures, adventures in the Futures is something, you know, um, I just, I think is amazing and awesome opportunity for me and my family. And they created a video with uh, some of the things that I had been doing over the last year and a little bit more of my story. And the crew that came to do this video captured pretty much 95% of the video um, locally here in central New York. So the video that you're about to see is, is pretty much done right here in either Binghamton, Cortland, or Ithaca area, except for the ending, which is pretty special. And I'll just say, wait for it. I remember the doctor's intern coming to the room where I was with my family and basically saying it's time to go in for surgery and unlocking the wheels on the gurney or whatever and, the, and then starting to wheel me away from my family. And this intern looks at me and he's like, you all right, you good? And uh, I look down at like the sheets and I just remember thinking there's two humps and when I wake up, there's gonna be one hump. That was just the new, you know, the new beginning. For me, being an above knee amputee and not having a knee or obviously everything below that knee on my right leg or on my right side, 
um, is going to make me rely completely on my left leg. So every foot I go up is a step on my left leg, and every foot I go down from something is a step down on my left leg. And uh, that's a lot to rely on. You know, you really hope that everything's going to hold up. This coming September, uh, many amputees, including myself, will be climbing a mountain called Cotopaxi in Ecuador, which reaches the summit of 19,347 feet. We want to show the world that you're not disabled by an amputation, but by the lack of a prosthetic service. And so if you have proper prosthetics, you can do just about anything you want. The big thing about Cotopaxi is, is obviously that it's almost 20,000 feet, which is an elevation that I've never experienced, so I have no idea how my body's going to handle that. It, it's definitely going to be a challenge, and I just want to be prepared as possible for that challenge. So anything I can do here back home in New York to be ready for that is uh, what I'm trying to do now. Train as if I was going to perform, so when I perform, it's like training. There's a lot of ways to work out and train, but if you're training and working out in ways that you're just not going to use every day or for specific purposes and goals, then it's not functional. My dad always said, you know, we'll figure it out when we get there. So it's one of those attitudes that I'm trying to just embrace that I can only do so much while I'm here. And then eventually I may just have to figure it out when I'm there because uh, there's things that I just can't plan for. When, when things start to get tough and uncomfortable, I, I tend to really embrace it and enjoy it. So being outside, if it's high heat, if it's rain, if it's snow, if it's just some crazy conditions, it, it's almost like makes me enjoy it more. Um, I, I just embrace the suck and really love to just get out there and, and, and feel uncomfortable because when I'm done, it just feels so much better. Like I feel like I've had so much more success because it was that much harder. I really truly believe like every obstacle in life is really an opportunity. No matter how successful you are at that obstacle or challenge that you're facing, being a cancer survivor, an amputee, um, and then all the stuff that's happened in between, you know, when that happened when I was 15, those challenges have opened up doors for me. I totally look at obstacles as a great thing and a, and a new thing in my life and another open door instead of something that's keeping me back. I'm Dan Kosick, and I train so I can live my life without limitations. Oh my god. As we get close to the, uh, the end of the formal program, I think about one of the images that was very front and center <clears throat> as part of the marketing for this event, and it's of a woman named Sue uh, with an artificial hand. And so I feel like I wouldn't want to get through the program without uh, that story being told, if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, about that capsule and project. Sure. Sue is, uh, she works in, uh, for Sodexo in one of the cafeteri cafeterias. I don't know if they're still called that. Um, that dates me, I guess. Like dormitories and cafeterias, right? But um, she's a wonderful, a wonderful person, and she's um, she's one of the friendliest people that you would ever want to meet. And she, um, some students, uh, as they always go to to a friendly face to get coffee or whatever it is that they're getting at, uh, in the morning, they they got to be really good friends, and they saw that she um, only has one arm, uh, one arm, one hand. And so, as their senior design project, they said, um, could we design a prosthetic um, arm and uh, hand for Sue? And I said, well, that's pretty challenging. Um, and they said, but they really want to do it. And because um, Sue's goal in life was to go bowling. And I thought, well, that might be a really ch a challenge for a prosthetic hand to go bowling. But they had a lot of enthusiasm. And they actually did design the hand and, and delivered it to Sue. 
And to see her um, when she does wear it on occasion is just so incredibly uh, rewarding. So it's one thing about these projects, oftentimes the students come to me with these ideas because they have good hearts. They see what, who needs what out in the community and they say, we'd like to make a difference. Can we do it? And that's really what I think is what's beautiful about the capstone design class. So at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions from the group. Do you have a question? Yes. Yes. Yep. There's always there's always something, and um, and who my my father's in up here, and he always says you got to figure it out when when it happens, you know, when it because you can't plan for everything. Um, I can actually I have my leg that I wear for these events back here. I can grab it, but. So, yeah, so there's, there's lots of things. Like, uh, for example, this rubber, basically tire tread on the bottom, has come off before in an event. And this is just carbon. And you cannot step on carbon. Um, if you stepped on a rock or something, it would just shatter. So, I mean, things like that, like you'd think, oh, I just need some epoxy to fix it. And it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But when you're stuck in knee deep mud and you have miles to go before you can fix it, you got to improvise and come up with a plan. And so it was like somebody around me, a bunch of people around me, shared some socks. We put as many socks over as possible, duct taped it as many times as we could to try to hold it, and then tiptoe for a couple miles until it was done. Um, I wear this thin belt when I run and stuff because obviously with sweat and activity, it, it starts to loosen up and it, and it keeps it from literally falling off. I learned my lesson. I was mountain biking once and I didn't have the belt on. And I was going down the hill and just <laughs> shaking, and I could feel it like coming off. And I got to the bottom, and I was in clipped pedals. And as soon as I stopped, my leg went <laughs> and just fell onto the ground, but still stuck to the pedal. And and I was like, I think I got to wear a belt now. And uh, so I started wearing a belt. But yeah, those kinds of issues pop up, and they do. And and I learn from them. And so the next time, I'll be like, well, if I want that, don't want that to happen again. This is what I got to do, or improvise, and maybe carry a little backpack with some tools and all that kind of stuff too. Yep. Yeah. So romp. It, um, I honestly don't know how long they've been in existence, but it's a fairly new uh, or public or non-for-profit organization, and they, uh, on average, can provide usually a prosthetic device for about a thousand dollars, which is like super cheap pennies compared to, for example, my insurance probably gets billed upwards of $70,000 for this leg that I'm wearing right now. Um, so when I say I'm wearing a Mercedes, I literally am, and it doesn't have heated seats or a Bose or anything. Um, so ROM can, they, they'll improvise, they'll take donations, they have 3D printing, they'll, they'll do whatever they can to make these prosthetics. And in countries such as right now, they have in Guatemala and Ecuador, they have permanent facilities where they help the locals. And you're right, you're talking about like a farmer who loses his arm, who needs to provide for his family. And by giving him a prosthetic arm, he now can provide for his family. Uh, and then they also set up uh, clinics, you know, temporary clinics around South America mostly to help these individuals. But they're trying to grow as fast as they can. 
Uh, you can also apply for grants through ROMP if you are looking for prosthetics um, in and out of our own country. Um, so they're doing, like they're growing, and, they're, and they realize this is a huge need, and, you know, and they're making little changes, but there's a long ways to go, I think, still. And you, and you mentioned wars, and, and it's crazy. Uh, the advancements in prosthetic really come when there's a war. So like the best, you know, when I first got my leg at 15, the, that technology was really advanced or came about because of the Vietnam War, which you would think is, was not very, you know, like the Vietnam War, you're talking in the early 70s or whatever, and late, or in the 60s, and here I am in 1993 um, needing a leg, and that's where the technology is coming from. And then we have the Iraq War, and all of a sudden you have bi um, uh, mechanicals where you have um, microprocessors in the knee, that's what I was trying to get at. And there are some bionics out there, but you know, there's a lot of myths. You know, people think like we have an advantage or something where we can jump over a building or run faster than someone with two legs or whatever. But there really isn't any advantages to someone who has a prosthetic leg or arm. Um, and the technology still has a long ways to go. And the best technology that's out there really isn't accessible to the majority of the people, almost everybody. Yeah. It, it's really like my leg for obstacle course racing and running and stuff. It's actually much simpler than the leg I'm wearing because it's less problems, less things that can go wrong or break. So um, it's, it's, yeah, it's heavy duty, good stainless steel, titanium, graphite type materials, but um, not a whole lot of, you know, technology in it. It's just, you know, trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, good question, Nikki. Um, I think for Willow, for, for example, um, I, did, I did a few projects with Stick. There, Sue is here from Stick somewhere. Huh? There's, yeah, and um, that was a few years ago. And one of the, the uh, um, caseworkers for Stick actually said, I need to take you out to uh, Willow's Wings um, because you'll be totally. Um, captivated by that. So it's primarily just through word of mouth. Um, and I, I, think, I think there would be many more projects that students and faculty may get involved in if they only knew about it. But it, it's, it's pretty hard, I think, to actually identify it. And from Willow, then I found out about Linda. But it, it, it was pretty much word of mouth. Uh, it would be nice if there was like this website that you could say, I want to do a service project in engineering, but we really don't have anything like that, unfortunately. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you both certainly check the box on your spine. <laughs> in particular, I, I'm, I'm struck by you never could have gotten yourself in the position to be able to check the spine of the man who decided to do leg on prosthetics. And to say that the opportunities that you have, you have created for yourself. And I know you're around. Um, it's tough because everyone's situation is different. So I, I never want to say I completely understand or know what someone's going through because they're facing something difficult in their life. Um, but 
I, I try to let them know that I might have some understanding of, of what it's like to go through a struggle, but then I try to live as a role model and say like these struggles, you don't may not realize it at that moment, but down the road, you'll appreciate it for how much stronger it makes you and, and who it turns you into being. And you'll end up appreciating and having gratitude for the things that you are hating right now in life probably. Um, and I, like I said, it was probably not until my adult years that I really understood this, I think. Um, fortunately, when I was younger, it was just that mentality of keeping up with my friends and doing the normal things um, that kept me going, I think. That, that was like, you know, and I had parents that told me, or never told me no, basically. I mean, not like, you know, I had to behave and stuff, but like, but like, I was like, I want to try this. Okay, go ahead and try it. You know, I think there was a handful of people in my life that were like, you know, maybe you shouldn't do that because you only have one good leg or something. But they, that was definitely the, the minority compared to the majority. The majority of the people in my life were like, just, yeah, try it. See if you can figure it out. And fortunately, things worked out. Are there any other questions? Our presenters will be here. Oh, yes, one more. Sorry. I just want to know, have any of your legs made locally? Um, <laughs> well, there's, there's obviously prosthetic providers everywhere. And um, I, I know some of the providers locally. And I had my very first leg made locally. And at that time, there really wasn't any therapist locally that could teach me how to run and do like play lacrosse and stuff. And so I met an amputee therapist who was interested in learning how to teach this to people that she worked with. So we ended up driving down to New York City to meet with a physical therapist regularly so I could learn how to run at that time. And then she would come back and sort of you know, rehearse and do the things that we were working on down there back here. And eventually when I was going down there so much, there was a prosthetist that would show up often and make adjustments to the legs that the therapist was working, you know, to the people that he was working with. And he started to make some minor adjustments to my legs. And eventually it was like, you know, I feel weird like going back and they're like, wait, who did this to your leg and whatever. So I decided, you know, after that point, I would go down there and start getting my legs made. And it's one of those things that you just really become comfortable with. And I've been with the same guy now for 26 years. And it's not, I, I'm sure I could find someone closer um, that could maybe do just as good of a job. But you know, when you find that relationship and how much they've supported me through the years, I, you know, I feel like we have this mutual thing going and, and that you know, I just can't leave. So I go to Long Island, actually. That's where my legs are made. Yeah. Our presenters will be here until 7.30. So please do stay around if you didn't have a chance to say hello. And if you have a question to ask, uh, feel free to stick around. Once again, thank you very much for coming to Tear Talks tonight. Thank you.